Father, we just come before you now as we just dive into your word, Lord, and we just pray, Holy Spirit, just illuminate the text to us. Allow us to see what you have to say to us this morning. Convict us, change us, transform us by your truth. Your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces joints and marrow, soul and spirit, divides the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And we pray this morning, Lord, that's exactly what you do. Just come and grow us, Lord Jesus. Just make us, make us new. We love you and we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, please turn with me. We're in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, specifically John chapter 1. Now during the 20th century, we had many uh, tremendous leaders who came up within the body of Christ. Great thinkers and leaders. Several come to, come to mention that I, that I personally think about. You have A.W. Tozer, of course Billy Graham, Jerry Bridges, R.C. Sproul, J. Vernon McGay, Martin Lloyd-Jones, many great pastors and leaders. But there was one man who comes to my mind, who sacrificed more than many. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was born in Germany in 1904. He was quickly recognized as a masterful biblical scholar and teacher. However, Bonhoeffer's ministry coincided, coincided with the rise of Hitler. And he struggled within his mind that the role of Christianity should play in a country that was being led down a path of destruction, with a government whose cruelty seemed endless. At the height of World War II, Bonhoeffer joined the resistance movement, and he was arrested for helping a group of Jews try to escape to Switzerland. But he was also implicated in the plot to assassinate Hitler. After two years in various prisons and concentration camps, he was marched up a flight of steps, and then he entered into the yard. There he prayed his last prayer, which was nothing short of grace. Just total grace that God had given him. And then he marched up the steps to the noose and he was hung with several other people. One particularly sobering letter described his decision to join the resistance movement. He understood that even if they were successful, his life, it would never be the same. This one decision, just one decision, would ultimately define him. Can you imagine knowing that just one decision that you would make in your life would ultimately define you? As we continue our journey through John's Gospel this morning, we're brought to the place where each and every one of us will have such a life-defining moment. Now, in the first five verses of this chapter, the Apostle John, he's given us a grand picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the other Gospels, the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tend to focus more on Jesus' humanity, especially in the earlier chapters, how he was born. But John, he goes straight to the high Christology of who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Lord Jesus Christ, He is presented to us here in this Gospel as the God-Man. Co-existent, co-eternal with the Father. He is the Logos. Literally, He is the spoken Word. The agent of creation, the maker and sustainer of all things that exist in the entire universe. Visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers and powers. The Lord Jesus Christ, He made them all. All things were made by Him. And by His power, by His word, all things hold together. Wrap your mind around that. That right there should just drop you to your knees and worship. Jesus Christ, He is the light that shines in the darkness. And John begins his gospel with the highest view of Christ that you could possibly have, this Christology that is found nowhere else in Scripture at this level. Maybe Colossians. Maybe the beginning of Hebrews. But here in verse 6, it's amazing. John, the apostle, he abruptly 
stops. He gives us this view of Jesus, but then he shifts his focus entirely to a man who was sent by God. The one who would herald the coming of Christ. Look at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, John the Baptist, he's a new character in the gospel. This is the first time that we are presented with him here. And the Apostle John, he's the author of this gospel, but he is never mentioned by name in his own writing. He never refers to himself as John. So every time you see the name John in John's gospel, it refers to John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And he is sent on a mission to relay an important message from God about Jesus to us. Now, from the last book of the Old Testament to the time we get here in the New Testament where we have the Gospels, there is a time lapse. It's known as the intertestamental period. And in this intertestamental period, there was silence. God did not speak for 400 years. But all of a sudden now we have John the Baptist. John comes on the scene and he has a very important message. The most urgent of messages that could ever be given. He was commissioned by God to prepare the hearts of the people for one major event. You see, John is called the Baptist because he was sent by God to baptize repentant sinners. He was sent to baptize repentant sinners in preparation for the Messiah's coming. He was sent to make straight the way for the Lord. And this is exactly what John did. His ministry was at the shore of the Jordan River, calling Israel to turn back to God and to have their hearts readied, to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. We're told in Matthew chapter 3, in those days, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, John was called to be a witness. And like the word believe, that is over a hundred times in this gospel, it's presented over a hundred times the word believe, the word witness is also prevalent. It's a word that John has a heart for. It's a word that he wants us to know well. It's used 14 times as a noun. And the verb form of martyreo is used 33 times just in this book. It's a legal term and it relates to facts, not opinions. It depicts a courtroom scene where one had to give their testimony under oath. And that is exactly what John has been given, and that's what he has been called to do. He has been commissioned to give a testimony. But what does John bear witness to? We're told in verse 7. Look at verse 7. He came as the witness to what? The light. John the Baptist was not the light, but he was sent to testify about the light of Jesus Christ. John was given a message. And what is that message? Well, we're given that answer as well. Look at verse 29. Verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was the first to announce publicly that Jesus was the Savior who had come. Now understand, again, John did not create his message. This is not something that he just contrived in his mind and said, you know what, I'm going to preach this message because I know I think that the Messiah is going to be coming here soon. No. He was simply sent as a forerunner of Christ to proclaim what had been divinely given to him by God. And that's exactly what he did. However, speaking the truth never comes without a price, does it? If you speak truth and you speak it boldly, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be persecuted. You're going to face hard times. And John, he was no different than any of us. Matter of fact, we find out here a few chapters later, what ends up, what ends up happening to John the Baptist? 
His head is served up on a platter in Herod's palace. You see, John, he is on a witness stand to share the testimony of the light. Let me ask you here this morning, though. How many of you have ever, ever told someone about the light? Take a moment and imagine a friend coming over to your home. And as you walk into each room, and your friend is with you, and it's in the evening, it's dark, and as you walk into each, each room, you, you, you say, come here. And you walk over to the light switch, and you flip it up. And you say, you may not have recognized this, but when I took that switch and I flipped it on, light came into this room. Then you go to the next room and you say the same thing. Watch this. And you turn the light switch on and like, behold, there's light. Your friends would look at you like you're crazy, would they not? They're thinking, what is wrong with this person? Do they need to be told that there's light in the room? No, they can see there's light in the room, right? The switch goes on. It's like, duh, the, there's light. We see it. We know it. It's, it's evident to everybody who's in the room. But here we have the Lord Jesus Christ, the true light that shines in the darkness coming into the world. Why did John the Baptist have to tell the people about the light? Why couldn't they just see? Because they were all blind. They were completely blind. You see, John the Baptist was sent to testify to a spiritually blind world. They were incapable of seeing and understanding spiritual things. And Paul tells us this directly in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Look what he writes. He says, The God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Listen, Jesus came into the world which He made. He dwelt amongst His creation. Yet the world was completely oblivious to His coming. Is that not astounding? It's mind-blowing. Matter of fact, A.W. Pink in his commentary, he gives such great insight to this reality. This is what he says. When the sun is shining in all of its beauty, who are the ones unconscious, unconscious to the fact? Who need to be told of its shining? The blind. How tragic then, when we read that, John, that God sent John to bear witness of the light. How pathetic that there should be any need for this. How solemn the statement that men have to be told the light is now in their midst. What a revelation of fallen man's condition. The one who created the world was in the world and the world could not see him. This is also important to understand. Though the world is under the control of Satan, and though he has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see, the world is also willfully blind of the light. They are willfully unable to see as well. They don't want to see it. They don't want to know who Christ is. And their sin in not seeing Jesus is inexcusable because he is the true revelation of God. When you see Jesus, who do you see? The Father. You see the Spirit. You see the Godhead in the exact perfection of what they are. Jesus represents them perfectly. John tells us in chapter 3. He says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Now, think about this. Christianity has been a religion that has been what? Hated. Hated. They hated Jesus when he came so much that they crucified him. They hated the apostles so much that they put them to death. You think in Rome, just in the Roman government, and you think of all the Roman emperors going from Nero to Domitian to Trajan, going all the way through to Marcus Aurelius to Valerian to Aurelian. Then you get to Diocletian. Diocletian, he was a madman. He said, I am going to crush Christianity. I am going to completely smear it off the face of the earth. But yet, he failed. He couldn't. He couldn't. 
Because God upholds it. God is the one who keeps it sustained. But does the world hate it? Absolutely. The world can't stand it. The nations over the past 2,000 years have tried its hardest to stomp it out. And if they can't stomp it out, what else have they tried to do? They've watered it down. They have taken the message and made it something that it is not. Have you ever asked yourself why Christianity is hated so much? Well, to answer that question, we need to address a few other questions first. For example, just in our generation, well, we'll go a couple generations back. Why was there such a push to remove prayer from our public schools? Why has evolution pushed down our kids' throat? Yes, they are not allowed to teach even intelligent design, let alone that the world was sustained and created by an almighty creator in six literal days. Why are they not allowed to teach these things? Why are we currently seeing our government and these Marxist groups trying so hard to erase our Christian heritage? Just recently, during a congressional debate about the so-called Equality Act, and I challenge you all to read up on the Equality Act because it is not the Equality Act by any stretch of the imagination. Matter of fact, all it is is a bill to literally make a way to come down on the churches for not agreeing with their agendas. But during their vote on the Equality Act, Jerry Nadler stepped up to the podium there in Congress and he said this, God's will is of no concern of this Congress. That's scary. That's scary. Beloved, why is Christianity hated so much? Because if they admit that there's a sovereign who rules over creation, who are they responsible to? If there is an almighty God, they are no longer the God of their life. They are under the authority of another. Beloved, why was Jesus crucified? The people love the darkness and hate the light and fear their deeds may be exposed. You see, people refuse to come to the light of Jesus Christ because they love their sin and they don't want anyone telling them it's wrong. That's why the world hates Christ. But the Word of God makes it clear. All are without excuse. There will be no excuses given on the day of judgment. Friend, if you're here this morning and you've yet to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, understand, you have no excuse. Zero. None. Nada. You are accountable. You know the truth. No one will ever be able to stand in front of Jesus Christ and say, I didn't know. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, For what can be seen or what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, His divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are what? Without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The heavens declare His glory. And I'll tell you what, the, claw, the cross declares His love. And all are without excuse. The true light which gives light to all men was in the world. The world was made through Him, and yet the world did not know Him. And as tragic as the world's rejection is of Jesus Christ, John now turns to an even greater tragedy, Israel's rejection. Listen, of all the people in the world, of all those who should have known, and when they saw Jesus and said, there He is, it would have been is Israel, the Jewish people. Think about this. Israel was given the law. They were given the prophets. They were chosen by God as His own special possession to know Him, to walk with Him, to commune with Him daily. And He promised them, a deliverer will come for you. And He gave detailed prophecies as to what to expect and what this deliverer would look like. 
You see, the Jewish people, they should have quickly identified Jesus as their Messiah, the one who would establish the new covenant, a better covenant. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah declared this day, and I want you to turn with me there. Many think that the new covenant is something that just came about in the New Testament, all of a sudden, abracadabra, here it is, the new covenant. But that's not the case. This was prophesied nearly 600 years earlier that the Lord was going to establish this new covenant with His people. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. The Jewish religious leaders were fully aware of all that the prophets declared. And they knew this very well, specifically this verse. Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, on the day when I took them from the from the from the when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sins no more. God is saying, you know what? You have messed up in the past. I gave you my covenant, my law. You didn't keep it, but I'm still not going to leave you. I'm still not going to forsake you. I'm going to give you something even better. I'm going to give you the new covenant. I'm going to give you my son. 600 years before Jesus came. You see, the new covenant really isn't that new. And here in chapter 1 of the fourth gospel, John the Baptist steps onto the scene, the scene and he screams to Israel, the day is here. The new covenant that Jeremiah spoke about, it's right here. It's right before us. It's happening. And Jesus fulfilled every detail of the prophets. But Jesus was not the Messiah, kind of Messiah they were looking for, was he? They wanted an earthly king, not a heavenly one. And in the hardness of their hearts, they flatly rejected him. Look at verse 11. He came to his own, John 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, we need to remember that John wrote this letter more than 50 years after his Lord was crucified. He was likely an elder in the church of Ephesus, an old man. And he penned these words, reflecting on all the miracles that Jesus performed in the midst of the Jewish people, healing the sick, raising the dead. Listen, Jesus made it abundantly clear who he was. <laughs> It makes me think about the one account that's given in Luke chapter 7. And Jesus, he's with his disciples, and he's walking along in the field. And you can just imagine these fields with all this wheat. And as, as his disciples are walking, they're just brushing their hands across the wheat. And some of them just take it and pluck a couple. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, what day was it? Remember what day it was on? It was the Sabbath. To the religious re leaders, by them just plucking that and rubbing it in their hands, that was considered work. That's how far they had taken the 613 laws that were given to them and just twisted them and morphed them into something that they were not. So the religious leaders see Jesus and his disciples plucking just a couple of the grain and rubbing them in their hands. And they come to him and say, What do you think you're doing? How dare you allow your disciples to pick that grain, to be able to rub that in their hands? And Jesus just looked at them, just shaking his head and again just thinking probably in his head, You have no clue who you're even speaking to. Do you remember what his response was? The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What was Jesus declaring? Uh, I am the creator of this wheat. I am God. The people should have known Jesus the minute he came on the scene, but they were completely in the dark. 
Their hearts were darkened by Satan. They were willfully in unbelief. Can you imagine being there to see the, crea the creator of the world trod those Gal Galilean fields? Can you imagine seeing him walk the streets of Jerusalem? Seeing his wisdom, love, and power that shone through his eyes and were felt through the touch of his hands. He was in the world. The world was made by him and yet the world did not know him. I think it's easy to read the account of what we are given here and just go, how stupid of a people could they be? How could they not see their Messiah? How could they not understand he's right there, all these miracles, everything he did? If I was there, I would have believed. Ah, uh, don't be so sure. Don't be so sure. I don't think we would have been any different. You know why? Because at one point, we were all lost. At one point, we were all in what? Darkness. Sin. And it was only by God's undeserved grace that we were able to have our eyes open to see. You see, John, to him, the supreme tragedy and irony, the people rubbed shoulders with God and yet they were unable to see. They had no use for Jesus because he didn't fit their mold of who they were expecting. They didn't want a dying Messiah. They wanted a concrete king who was going to come in and take out Rome. They didn't want spiritual salvation. They wanted physical liberation from their enemies. You see, the promised Christ, the light that was sent by God to save the Jewish people was outright rejected. He was rejected. And this is a theme that we're going to see throughout this book, throughout these 21 chapters. Jesus is the rejected one. But there was some who believe, praise God. Look at verse 12. You see that first word? In the Greek is de. Just but. But. And it's a conjunction right here. And it marks a major shift in this passage. Yes, there's many who deny. There are many who hate. There are many who rejected Christ. But that no way negates God's plan to receive a people unto himself. Look at verse 12 all the way. But to all who did receive him, who received or who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Beloved, how does one become a Christian? We must receive Jesus by what? Believing. By trusting. And if you placed your faith in Christ, something amazing has happened to you. You were once enemies of God, Creatures of wrath. But in that moment, when you believed, God regenerated your heart and He made you His own. At that moment of conversion, you were brought into the family of God. You were brought from death to life. And as His children, we who deserved death are now made to share in the fullness of God's inheritance. We can't say... <laughs> This is something important to understand as well. We don't deserve this. This isn't something any of us deserve. We can't say I've given myself the right to be called a child of God. Because only Jesus can do that for us. He alone has the authority to declare sinners righteous. He alone has the right to make us children of God. He alone can make God-haters like you and me fully accepted in the Beloved. Going back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, do you see how this one decision to receive Christ completely defines your life? Our lives are radically altered by our position in the family of God. We no longer need to fear the future because we know that we're going to the Father's house. Amen? Amen. We know where our future lies. We know what comes for the believer. We no longer need to worry about whether our needs on this earth are going to be met because we know that we have a Heavenly Father who gives good gifts to those who belong to Him, huh, even to those who don't. Listen, our hope, our expectation is not in this world. We've been given a new hope, a better hope, a true hope. Is that not exciting? Am I the only one that's excited about this? No. 
It's a wonderful thing, a wonderful truth. And someday soon, as children of the King of Kings, we will shine like the sun in the Father's kingdom. You see, John the Baptist was sent to witness about the one who alone has the power to transform hearts and minds. And his witness forces each person to make a decision. Will I reject Jesus Christ or will I receive him? Two options. What will I do with him? What will I do with Jesus? But here in this text, we must also answer another important question that is brought before us. If all men and women are born into darkness, which the Bible makes very clear, blind to the truth of Christ, and slaves to their sinful nature, children of wrath, how do some receive Jesus and believe? Verse 13 gives us the answer to why some can hear the gospel and then faith their place, or place their faith in Christ, where others can hear the message over and over and over again and never see it, never understand. Look at the end of verse 13. Actually, look at verse 13 in its full context. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of what? God. Born of God. Listen, the apostle wastes no time in his gospel to get to the heart of salvation. Though people cannot be saved until they receive and believe in Jesus Christ, it is only through the power of God that one is brought into God's family. It is only through His power. Think on Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation for all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. It's all God's power. What causes some to believe and some not? God's power. You see, God must intervene and open our hearts for us to see our need for Jesus Christ. Paul tells us why God has given has need to intervene in Romans 2:10. As it is written, none is righteous, no not one. None, no one understands. Look at that next phrase right there. How many seek after God? No one. No one. He's quoting from Psalm 53 and Psalm 14. He's making it very clear. No one seeks, truly seeks after God on their own. Why? Because they're spiritually dead and blind to spiritual things. You see, the sobering truth of the Word of God is we can only be saved by a direct intervention from God. Because apart from His choice, we would never, ever choose Him. Listen, the sovereignty of God, it pulsates through this entire book. But before we dive into the last three words of verse 13, the apostle gives us three wrong reasons why people think that God saves them. So let's look at those. Some think that God saves them based on their racial or ethnic background. And this false notion actually was very, very prevalent in Jesus' day. The Jews thought that since they were God's chosen people, they were automatically good to go. Yeah, well, you know, we don't have to worry about anything else. We just, we're God's people, we're good. But the Lord made it clear to them that their heritage was meaningless if there was no heart behind their actions. And it's kind of interesting because we also see this type of thinking in our own day. Sarah and I were recently, we went to the uh, Three Rivers Festival. And we decided to park a ways away. And we started walking into the festival and we had to go over the Martin Luther King Bridge. Now, you start going over the Martin Luther King Bridge, you see some interesting things on there. We quickly found out. There was, a, a, there was several street preachers who were... <sighs> Well, some of them, I don't know what they were preaching, but they were out there and they were, you know, had Bibles in their hands and they were, you know, just shouting and speaking in King James and, you know, it was quite, I, was, you know, I looked at Sarah and go, okay, you know, we're definitely, you know, this is different. But then we came to a specific group and it was a group of African American men and they had these posters out there and Sarah instantly saw the poster and it really caught my attention. I was like, well, that's not right. And it said on there that, 
Esau was not a white man. And then we started listening. They had a couple, a couple uh, bystanders who were walking by tried to dialogue with them. And they tried to figure, you know, to see where they were coming from. But what they stood for was a theology known as Black Liberation Theology. Black Liberation Theology. Now, Black Liberation Theology is a false gospel that seeks to speak to the world problems of our day. Its attention is on social justice rather than on the spiritual need for salvation. Black liberation theology is focused on a savior who will deliver man from earthly slavery rather than a savior who saves man from spiritual bondage of sin and death. And within this movement, Jesus was not the traditional Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world and promising eternal life to those who follow in his footsteps. No. They teach that Jesus was a revolutionary black leader who sought to free, free Israel's black Jews from oppression and bondage, dying not for eternal salvation of the world, but for the rebirth of a lost black nation. And believe it or not, this is actually gaining a lot of traction in our day. It's on the rise. It came up about a decade ago, but in the last two years, it's really gaining more support. In a nutshell, it's a false gospel that preaches a collective salvation by race. Is this biblical? <laughs> Absolutely not. Here in these opening verses of John's gospel, he tells us this is simply not the case. He says no one will be saved because of their ethnic or racial background. No one will be saved because of their blood. Matter of fact, Paul makes this extremely clear that God shows absolutely no partiality to anyone. What does he tell us in Galatians 3? For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither no male and female, for you are all what? One in Christ. You're all one in Christ. Ethnicity plays no factor in salvation. But how about the next part in that verse? How about sincerity? How about sincerity? Some believe that God saved people based on their earnestness, on their genuineness. As long as they sincerely believe something, then they'll be okay. In other words, if you're sincere in what you believe, God will accept you. And I'll be the first to say that there are many truly sincere people out there. I've met some Mormons that would give you the shirt off of their back that are so sincere in what they believe and what the church has taught them. I've met atheists who do great work for the poor. And there's people who go to church every single Sunday. They teach Sunday school. They're super active in their congregations. They are sincere in their love for the church. Very sincere in their love for the church. But they have never come to know their Savior. Beloved, understand, nowhere in the Bible are we told that being sincere will get you to heaven. The Bible makes it extremely clear. There are many sincere people who are on the broad road to destruction because there is only one gospel that saves. To a world that views the claim of exclusivity as intolerant, the Word of God unashamedly declares that there is only one way and all others are counterfeits that lead to what? Death. Death. Matter of fact, Paul again made this extremely clear in Galatians 1. Look what he writes. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be what? Accursed. Anathema. Literally damned. As we have said before, he says this twice, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Proverbs 14, 12 tells us that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its way ends in what? Death. Beloved, there are many, many, many sincere people who die every single day who are self-deceived into thinking that they're going to be welcomed into heaven. But they have never been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. They have never been converted by the sovereign work of God. They haven't been born again. And no one will be saved by the will of the flesh. 
No one. Third, some think that God saves people because of their effort. I've, had, I've met people who they're banking their eternal destiny that their good deeds are going to outweigh their bad deeds. I'm a decent person. I'm way better than that guy over there. Oh, I'm way better than the people on this reality TV show. But understand, that's not how God works. He does not grade on a curve. There's many who try to live upright moral lives. And by doing so, they're hoping that they're going to be okay. But again, this teaching is completely foreign to the Word of God. It's not in it. We're told by Paul that the work, by the works of the law, no one will be justified in his sight. Meaning no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, if your faith isn't placed solely in Christ to get you into heaven, you're not in a good place. You're headed down a very bad road. You see, the fact of the matter is, no amount of work or human effort will ever bring a person into the family of God. No one will be saved by their ethnicity. No one will be saved by their sincerity. Nor will anyone be saved through the will of man. It just won't happen. So according to the last three words of this verse, how are we saved? Look at those last three words of verse 13. You must be born of who? God. You must be spiritually born again. And the only way that one could be born again is if God chooses to regenerate them. Apart from His choice of us, again, we would never choose Him. We can't. You see, upholding every decision to believe is the foundation of God's sovereign grace. In this teaching, teaching it flows throughout the entire New Testament and Old Testament for that matter in God's choosing of Israel. We're told in James 1.8 in the exercise of His will note those words and I ask you I, I got a little note section on the bottom of your, of your handout. Write these verses down. Go back and look at them. Go back and study them. It's important. This is important to understand. James 1.8 In the exercise of His will, He gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. 1 Peter 1 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has what? caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Who brought you to life? Who caused you to come to life? God did. You see, for every decision a person makes to turn and receive Jesus, it stands in the decision of God to give that person a new life. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, But we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God, what? Chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Oh, and we can't forget what Jesus told His disciples. You did not choose me, but what? I chose you that you should go and bear fruit. Again, Paul tells us in Titus chapter 3, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 10, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are what? Chosen, so that they may also attain salvation, which is Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. 2 Timothy 1.9 Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not to our works, but according to what? His purposes, His ways, His grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from when? All eternity. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. He chose us in Him before what? The foundation of the world. 
again and again, you need to understand the doctrine of election, the doctrine of God's sovereign choosing of His elect, it pours from the pages of Scripture. We can go all day on this. You need to read Romans chapter 9. That chapter is nothing but specifically to this doctrine. Read Romans chapter 9. Again and again and again, the Bible makes it extremely clear. Men do not choose God. God chooses men. Now granted, many people dislike this teaching because it distracts, it detracts from our efforts, does it not? And it humbles us to realize that we're completely dependent on Him for everything. But you need to understand, that's exactly the point. The fact that God chooses sinners and not the other way around, what does it do? You see, the doctrine of sovereign election, it elevates God. Oh, and it smashes our pride, does it not? It just crushes us. And understand, humility is exactly what we need. Listen, if you're a Christian sitting here this morning, it's only because God in His sovereign mercy chose to open your eyes that you could see and then believe. It was by His will, by His choice, that He brought us into His family. It was by His sovereign grace, completely apart from any human effort, that He made us His own. In 1979... China created a policy that allowed a family to have only one child. And for many Chinese, they desired to have a boy to carry on the family name. And this meant that many of the girls, if a baby was born and they didn't know it was going to be a girl and it was a girl, they took that baby and they discarded it. Infanticide was through the roof in China for many years. It still is. Many were starved to death, abandoned, but there were several families, American families, who stepped in and tried to save some of these children. One of these families was the Browns. On Mother's Day of 2006, they traveled to China to pick up the newest member of their family. A 10-month-old girl who had been abandoned the day after she had been born. A few months before they went overseas to meet and bring her home, they wrote a letter about their de decision to adopt. I think within a nanosecond of deciding to adopt, we knew what our daughter's name would be. In fact, I don't ever recall discussing it that much. Perhaps it's why we chose to adopt. Our driving motivation was to rescue a little girl and give her a family with a hope and a future. This helpless little girl who lives on the other side of the earth will receive all the benefits of being my child. I will clothe her. I will feed her. She will take on my name and receive my deepest affection. She will be the object of my love. My energies will be directed towards helping, instructing, and training her to be happy with a secured knowledge that I will never leave her. I will pour out my heart to introduce her to the Savior of the world who can take away all of her sins and give her eternal security. Of course, all this is done as we completely depend on God and His strength. Where would we be without the love of God? Where would we be without Him revealing Himself to us in Scripture? Where would we be without Him divinely sacrificing His own Son and seeking us out to rescue us? So for us, and what this adoption is a reflection of, we only had one name to choose from. Grace. Is there a better word than grace to describe the adoption of this little girl? Take a moment and think about this. She could do absolutely nothing of her own effort to become part of this family, could she? She couldn't do anything except go goo goo and gaga. No desire, no effort on her part could ever have connected her to this man and woman who would become her mommy and daddy. Her, her adoption into this loving family was the result of someone outside of herself choosing to love her. Choosing to receive her. To give her the right to be called their child. 
Someone had to do for her what she could not do for herself. Beloved, that's grace. That's true grace. And that's exactly what God did for us. While we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, we were blinded in our unbelief and completely incapable of doing anything to save ourselves, God chose to open our eyes to believe. He chose to receive us to himself and call us his children. Understand your salvation, it is all, it is all of God, completely. We can't take credit for anything. Is it humbling? Yeah, it's meant to be. It's meant to be humbling. It's meant to, for us just to take a step back and go, Lord, why? And just to thank Him. Just to thank Him for who He is. Think about this. Even when we exercise our faith and we believe, it's only because He gave us a gift of faith that, to see in the first place. This is what we're told in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that, that no one can boast. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is what? It is a gift. Can a gift be earned? No. Now in the Greek, this is a combined clause right here. The gift is both the grace and the faith. You can't separate them. They are both a gift. Beloved, when you reflect on the wonder of your salvation, all you can do is bow a knee and say, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for choosing me out of this corrupt world. Why? It's nothing in me. Nothing in me. I'm wicked. I'm a wretch. I deserve hell. It's nothing in me. It is all in Him, praise God. It's all in Him. And you just say, oh Lord, you're so good. You're so good. <laughs> Why did you place your sovereign redeeming love on me? I don't know. I just praise you for it. You see, God sent John the Baptist to testify to the truth of the light. And his witness forces each person to consider, will I accept or will I reject Jesus Christ? What will I do with Jesus? What will I do with this testimony? If you have not trusted your life to Christ, I plead with you this morning. I beg you, turn to Him, repent, and be saved. If you feel Him calling on your heart, if you feel Him drawing you towards Himself, confess your sins. Come to Him. Receive Him. Don't turn Him away. He promises that all who come to Him, all who receive Him, He will never cast out. Beloved, we serve an awesome God, do we not? Can I have the band come up? I challenge you this week. Take some time, and if you belong to Him, praise Him for your salvation. Praise Him for what He has done for you. Give Him glory for that incredible gift that is beyond anything that we could possibly fathom. Grace upon grace upon grace. Amen. Father, oh, how we love Your Word. It cuts, it convicts, it challenges the heart. This is a hard teaching, and I know it's a hard teaching, Lord, but your word is so good, and it's so true in all that it declares. And I just pray this morning, if there's anybody who is out there right now in our congregation or who's going to watch this online, Lord, who is struggling with this doctrine, I just pray, Lord, they draw near to you through your word. Search it out. To search out your truth. 
to search out who you are. Lord, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for adopting us when we didn't do anything or deserve nothing. You adopted us because you are good, not because we are. You gave us an inheritance that is beyond understanding because you were magnificent and holy when we are not. We praise you for all that we have. We just love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this morning to be able to draw near to you. And again, Lord, just uh, continue just to sanctify us and grow us close to you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' more wonderful name, amen. The following sermon was presented to you by Pathway Christian of Harlan. If you are in any way encouraged by this message or would you like to know more, we would love to hear from you. Please visit our website at pathwaychristianharlan.com or you can reach out by calling our office at 260-234-8571 or by mail at 12732 Spencerville Road, Harlan, Indiana 46743. Until next time here at Pathway, God bless.